Earlier this month, neighboring Japan warned of a giant earthquake after a 7.1 magnitude quake struck off its southern coast. The warning was lifted after a week, but not before triggering a broader debate about the wisdom of the warning, including its necessity as well as accuracy. Hello and welcome. You're watching Issues and Insiders for this Thursday, August 22nd here in South Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. So is the world likely to witness a mega quake in the foreseeable future? To answer this question, today I have Professor James Hammond from the Birkbeck University of London here in the studio. Professor Hammond, it's a pleasure to have you with us. A oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. I also have Professor Kim Pyongmin at Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology live on the line. Professor Kim, it's good to have you on. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Professor Hammond, we'll start here in the studio. Has there been a rise in the number of earthquakes in recent years? Uh, no. So um, we get about 15 magnitude 7 earthquakes and larger every year. Uh, this year we've had about eight, so we're pretty much on average. Uh, sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less, so it can feel like you get more earthquakes. Um, and also, you know, there's more vulnerability, more people are living in areas earth prone to earthquakes, and also communication is better. So we hear about these earthquakes more. But on average, the number is, is pretty much the same. Um, so we haven't been seeing a higher number with regard to the frequency of earthquakes in recent years then? No. So no. the misconception is based on perhaps more coverage? More coverage, more people feeling them, these kind of things, yeah. Right, I see. Professor Kim, how vulnerable now is uh, Korea to a major earthquake in the foreseeable future? Oh, yes, it's uh, very interesting to uh, consider the vulnerability of earthquakes. Um, earthquake hazards are related to the strength and frequency of earthquakes. And vulnerability refers to the resistance of structures and infrastructure against earthquakes. And I would say that the earthquake hazard in Korea is not as high compared to neighboring countries like Japan, Taiwan, and China. Uh, but Korea could still be vulnerable to uh, strong earthquakes. Uh, until recently, we hadn't focused much on uh, seismic design and retrofitting, uh, even though we now recognize their importance. Uh, also, Korea has many you know, densely populated metropolitan areas and critical structures like power plants. So therefore, uh, if a strong earthquake were to occur in the future, uh, Korea could be at high risk. And Professor Kim, for some more perspective, perhaps, what can you tell us about some of the strongest earthquakes to have struck Korea in the past? Yeah, uh, we all still remember the uh, 2016 Gyeongju earthquake and uh, the 2017 Puang earthquakes with magnitudes of uh, 5.8 and 5.4 respectively. Uh, it has been seven years since those two events, uh, but they remain fresh in our minds. Uh, I believe it's uh, crucial not to forget them. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, Gyeongju earthquake and Puang earthquakes are not the only strong earthquakes in Korea. Uh, we began instrumentally recording earthquakes uh, in the 1970s, but there were other significant earthquakes before that. Uh, some strong earthquakes were documented in the records from the Joseon dynasty, and some researchers estimated that the magnitudes of these historical earthquakes could have been around six or seven. Right, I see. Professor Hammond, like I mentioned earlier in the clip before the start of our talk, Japan earlier this month issued its first ever warning of a mega quake. The warning itself was lifted after a week. But first, what is a mega quake and how devastating or destructive might it be? Yeah, so a mega quake, it's not really a scientific term. Terminology. Okay. Um, but a mega quake is just referring to some of the biggest earthquakes that we might see. So typically a magnitude eight and above. Um, and so we've seen the impacts of this, right? The Tohoku earthquake in 2011, um, you know, caused a huge amount of energy gets released. So many minutes of shaking, um, it can damage buildings like Professor Kim was talking about, and it can create other things like landslides uh, and the tsunami that we saw in 2011. So they can, these biggest earthquakes can be very, very damaging indeed. 
What are the prospects, Professor Hammond, of an earthquake magnitude perhaps 10 and above? Is that also a possibility? I think the, the, the maximum magnitudes we reach are probably within the magnitude 9. I think the biggest we've ever seen um, in historical record is about 9.4, I think, which was in Chile. And the thinking is we can't get much bigger than that because you have to rupture, you have to break ground over a huge area and the faults just simply aren't that big. So I think a magnitude 10 is very unlikely. Right, I see. Some pundits, Professor Hammond, have questioned the wisdom of the warning issued by Japan, sharing or casting doubt, that is, on its accuracy as well as its necessity. What are your thoughts on this? It is really interesting, right? This is the first time any government has uh, issued a warning like this. And I think it was inspired by the 2011 earthquake where the main shock, the magnitude nine earthquake was preceded by a smaller earthquake. But many big earthquakes are not preceded by smaller earthquakes and many smaller earthquakes don't go on to um, cause bigger earthquakes. And I think it's important to point out that the Japanese authorities did not predict a mega earthquake, right? They, they're not trying to say they think this is happening. What they've tried to communicate is that the chances of it happening may have increased slightly because of the changes in, you know, when one earthquake happens, it changes the stress within the crust and it can cause other earthquakes to happen. And so I think this is the real challenge in issuing this warning is it's one of communication. It's one of making sure people understand that you're not saying an earthquake is going to happen, but you're saying this is an opportunity to make sure you're prepared, make sure your house is as safe as possible, making sure you, if you've got vulnerable loved ones that they're safe and you know what to do in case of an evacuation. So doing that is a real challenge in a way that doesn't create um, worry and concern and panic. And, so that's something I think they'll look at this and maybe learn some lessons for the future. Because uh, there's definitely a benefit in using these opportunities to, to remind people of the hazards that, that they may face. Right, and to raise greater awareness perhaps. And Professor K, what about you? Do you believe the Earth will witness a mega quake in the future? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll witness many more uh, mega quakes in the future around the world. Uh, as uh, Professor Hammond mentioned, that we have already seen uh, several uh, ones, uh, including the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. And there is another one in Indonesia in 2004, and another one in Alaska in uh, 1964. And all of these uh, earthquakes had magnitudes greater than 9.0. And also, uh, uh, there have been many uh, more uh, mega quakes with magnitudes greater than 8.0. Uh, so yes, uh, it's likely that we'll witness, uh, we'll experience more mega quakes in the future. I think it's uh, uh, important not to uh, forget that there is a high possibility in the future. Professor Kim, hypothetically, what would be the impact of a mega quake in neighboring Japan on Korea, do you think? Uh, if a mega quake occurs in Japan, um, you know, for example, magnitude 8 and magnitude 9, uh, it could impact Korea, I think. Uh, there are, you know, there are stresses uh, constantly accumulating under the ground. And when uh, these stresses are suddenly released, an earthquake occurs. Uh, if a mega, a mega quake in Japan releases these stresses, uh, it could transfer uh, some of the stresses to uh, neighboring regions uh, like Korea. Uh, this would increase the stresses in Korea, uh, eventually uh, raising the likelihood of earthquakes in Korea. Right. Professor Hammond, beyond this particular region then, what are some other regions that remain prone to earthquakes as we speak? Yeah, so as Professor Kim mentioned, there's many areas of experience these big earthquakes, and they tend to happen on what we call subduction zones, where two tectonic plates come together. And we see that a lot around the Pacific, which drives earthquakes there. But there are lots of other areas as well. So for example, last week I was in Mongolia, um, and we had a conference on hazards across Asia. And there was a lot of discussion around the earthquake hazard within Asia, 
where the fault zones are not very well defined. And that actually presents a bigger challenge because we don't know exactly where the earthquakes will happen. And so therefore, understanding the impacts, what, what might shake um, and how that impacts nearby cities is, is a bigger challenge. So some of the most destructive earthquakes have actually been in this area where, because we don't know the hazard uh, so well. Right. And given that uncertainty, Professor Hammond, what do you suppose is the importance of having these gatherings and meetings together among pundits where they talk about these hazards? Because you're here in South Korea to attend such a meeting over in Busan, you were saying. That's correct, yeah. So I went from one in Ulaanbaatar and I'm going to another one in Busan. And they're essential, you know, and they're really what we try to do at these meetings is not just bring together people who study maybe the earthquake hazards or seismologists like myself, but also try to bring together people who are working on the response side and the management side so we can understand not just you know the data that underpins some of the decisions and where we might be missing that data and i think that's really key because our ability for hazard assessments and for building resilience is only as good as the data that underpins that and so it's understanding that interplay is really important right professor kim Moving forward now, some pundits have spoken about a tangible connection between climate change and earthquakes. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think it's a possible idea, uh, although it's very difficult to find a direct co correlation between the climate change and earthquake occurrence. Uh, I think this is mainly because the history of earthquake recording is relatively short. Uh, I think it's only about 50 years globally. And I know that the uh, number of earthquakes is increasing worldwide. I think this is a slightly different opinion from Professor Hamon. Uh, but I also observed that earthquakes in Korea have become uh, more frequent over the you know, past 20 years or so. Uh, we also know that the planet is getting warmer. So I think there could be uh, some correlations. And also recently, I came across studies by scientists and researchers uh, exploring the potential correlation between earthquake occurrences, uh, sea level rise, and rainfall amounts. Uh, I, I think their arguments seem reasonable. Uh, so it's possible that uh, there could be some uh, connection. Uh, I th and also, I think we need to uh, keep on uh, doing research on this topic. Professor Kim, I'm going to ask you an impromptu question, a very brief one. You spoke about how earthquakes here in Korea appear to be, uh, appear to be becoming a bit more frequent. What is the reason for this, do you suppose? Uh, yeah, honestly, I don't know exact reason, but uh, there could be some climate, climate change. Um, but uh, when I see the histogram of earthquake you know, numbers, uh, I think it's uh, you know, increasing. Uh, so I need to. I think. I think we need to do more research on it uh, to find out the exact reason. But there could be some other, you know, uh, the complex, you know, the reasons you know, combined together. Uh, but I, I think we need further studies on it. Right, for sure, for sure. Professor Hammond, do you believe there is a connection between climate change and earthquakes, or is this based on, pardon the pun, shaky ground? <laughs> um, there's potential, yeah. So as Professor Kim was saying, you know, our instrumental record is quite short. But if you look back in the geological record, you know, we can look to see if big earthquakes have happened in the past through something called paleo seismology. And for example, in Scandinavia, where it's not on a tectonic plate, so you don't expect to see big earthquakes there, but they do see evidence of big earthquakes in the last few thousand years. And the reason that for that largely is the ice crack caps have retreated. So potentially, if, if as the ice caps melt, you reduce the, the a load on the crust and it rebounds. And as it rebounds, it's changing all the stresses within the crust and that can cause faults to move. So I think there is the potential for um, earthquakes to uh, happen in response to changes in sea levels and changes in, in ice uh, loads and things like this. Yeah. And staying with perhaps the causes of earthquakes, how, to what extent does men perhaps and their activities on earth affect earthquakes, do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we try to induce earthquakes sometimes, right? You know, in geothermal settings or 
um, so-called fracking, right, where we're, we, that is exactly what we're trying to do to increase the fluid flow through the rocks. So in some places we try to do this, in other places we don't, and it happens by accident. So for example, you could fill a dam with water that may change the stresses in the ground and it can change the nature of the earthquakes. Sometimes stops them, sometimes causes them, right? So what we need to do is, if we're gonna build this big infrastructure, is understand where these faults are, you know, so, and understand what the stresses within the crust are. So then you can try and do that in a way that minimizes those kind of impacts. Right. Professor Hammond, is the presence of, or the occurrence of sinkholes perhaps an indication of an imminent earthquake or I or think danger? that's, it's, it's a slightly different geological process, I think, where it's kind of eroding the ground and you, you, you produce these big sinkholes. But earthquakes themselves can cause things like liquefaction where the shaking causes water to rise and then you get a lot of subsidence and things like this. So one of the, one of the things we were exploring in Mongolia actually was the interplay of all these different hazards. So you can't just think of an earthquake alone, you think about it in conjunction with landslides or tsunamis or subsidence and things like this because they all have a connection with each other. Right, I see. On a light note, Professor Hammond, can animals predict earthquakes? Um, no, I don't think so. I think people have actually studied this and there's been no conclusive evidence that they can do this. So it's all anecdotal evidence, I would say. And I think I would say animals and humans cannot predict earthquakes. All we can do is try to um, monitor them, we can provide early warning systems, we can understand which areas are prone to shaking from earthquakes, and we can build, make sure building codes can withstand that shaking. And I think that's, places like Japan have done that very well actually, and I think we can learn from that and try to make sure other countries benefit from those, that experience as well. Right, and staying with these preventative measures then, Professor Kim, speaking within your capacity, of course, as a scholar in, in civil and earth engineering, how resilient is capital soil to a major quake? Uh, the resilience is another interesting um, concept, and uh, uh, the scholars are in increasingly focusing on the resilience against earthquakes. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to predict the exact timing and locations of earthquakes, uh, but the community is doing its best to minimize the damage by, uh, by designing the new structure strong enough and uh, by doing retrofitting of, uh, to the existing structures. Uh, but some damages is uh, inevitable. Uh, so resilience refers to the how we can recover from the uh, earthquake damage uh, fortunately, we have learned a lot from the past earthquakes in Korea, and now there is a widespread awareness that the earthquakes can occur in, at any time in Korea. Uh, so I know that uh, governments and researchers and uh, civic organizations are doing their best to prepare for the potential earthquake damage. Uh, and they, uh, again, but I, uh, it's very difficult to quantify the current level of resilience in Seoul and any, any areas in Korea right now. Uh, but I'm sure that the resilience has been uh, strengthened by the effort of those uh, the organizations. And uh, resilience will continue to improve with the ongoing uh, awareness and effort of everyone in the community. Right. Hopefully you're right, Professor Kim, and we'll end on those reassuring words from you. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, Professor Kim. And Professor Hammond here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow.